Good morning, everyone. Let's bow our heads together for an added word of prayer. <clears throat> Loving Father, we are grateful for the privilege and the honor that we have to spend time in your presence today. Lord, there are so many things that are pressing upon us, and we pray that our time together may lend itself towards burdens being lifted and each one who is in this place and those who are joining us on the stream that uh, our time would lend itself to helping us to experience the blessing and the rest and the peace that only you can provide. It is in fact a peace that passes understanding and that means Lord that the circumstances and the context of our life would suggest that we should not have peace, that we cannot have peace, that we will not have peace. And yet, because you offer us peace, even in the midst of a storm, we choose to believe that it's possible to experience this peace and rest. Lord, I pray and ask that your spirit will continue to be with us, that this piece of clay would not get it in the way of what you intend for each one of your people to hear. Have mercy on me and on us as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to um, <clears throat> start just by uh, reminding everyone that we are going to have a Pathfinder Club here at Troy again after a little bit of time off. And so uh, for those who are interested, I'm going to need your John Hancock. I'm going to need some of your signatures to put your name down and say, yes, I'm committing. I'm committing to this. You'll be doing that. Uh, you'll be helping our young people. You'll be helping me. So let's, uh, let's keep that in our minds and, and also in our prayers. Um, man, 100 years is a long time, is it not? Okay, some people, you act like you've lived over 100 years. But for the rest of us, we can say that 100 years is a long time. And praise God. Praise God for the blessing and the gift of life. And we certainly want to uh, remember in our prayers and uh, make time to celebrate together with the Morgan family that uh, milestone. And I see a, see a young man's face I haven't seen in a while back there. Brother Talent and his family. Um, it's good to see you. Good to see you. We've been praying for you and your studies. God bless you. God bless you. It was uh, a Christian missionary and author by the name of E. Stanley Jones who had this to say concerning surrender. If you don't surrender to God, don't think you don't surrender. Everybody surrenders to something. Everybody surrenders to something. I don't know about you, but life is filled with the pursuit of success and the drive to win and to accomplish whatever it is that you and I set our hearts and our minds towards accomplishing. Whatever the field, perhaps of academic study that we are engaged in or the profession that we're in, every one of us wants to be the very best. And I'm not suggesting to you that we should not. I believe that because we 
represent the creator of the universe, we should strive for excellence in whatever it is that we do. No, no one said amen. Am I in the right place? All right, all right. We should strive for excellence in every single thing that we do. The Bible promises that the people of God in the Old Testament, and, and these are promises that are available to us through Jesus Christ, that the people of God would be the head and not the tail. And so we should strive for excellence, but there is a social context in which we live that it drives us to be not only excellent for the glory of God, but it drives us to be uh, number one. It drives us to win for our own personal satisfaction. And I'm not, again, suggesting that there is always anything wrong with this, but this continual pursuit, this continued drive to succeed and to win can become tiring. It can become all-consuming. And it can, in fact, run contrary to something that the scriptures are pressing upon us as believers, and that is our need to surrender. How can I surrender when I live in a context that says never give up, never surrender? How can I embrace surrender? How can I embrace submission when I live in a culture that says never tap out, no matter how difficult, no matter how hard it gets? Going up, going up, I learned this as I was preparing for this message, going up is always easier than coming down. What do I mean? Those who make it their hobby or their profession to climb mountains suggest <clears throat> that 80%, what percent, my dear friends? 80% of the catastrophes and the loss of life that take place with those who are climbing mountains does not happen on the way up, but it happens on the way down. It caused me to rethink the words of a song that I heard growing up. I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain. Perhaps it's not climbing up the rough side of the mountain that we ought to be so concerned about, but coming down the mountain. There is a story in an expedition that demonstrates the truth of this. I was reading the book so fascinated when I came across the story that I, I had to get the book and there was a documentary and I went through the documentary and I watched as these two men had journeyed, journeyed to the country of Peru and they were going to scale one of the mountains there in the Andes. One of them was 21 years old, the other one was 25 years old and they went up and they were going to climb alpine style. I don't know if you know what that means. I had no idea what it meant. But simply put, it is perhaps the most difficult way to climb. Because once you are committed to the ascent, there is really and truly no turning back. No turning back. They made it to the top. They scaled this mountain and they stood there at its summit. And that's who the quote came from about the 80%. Wouldn't you know it, on the way down, catastrophe strikes. One of this group of two falls and he breaks his leg. In fact, the lower bone came up through his knee. He was in excruciating pain and it gets worse. As they are continuing their descent, one of them is holding the rope and the other one is descending 
and he falls over a ledge. This is the one with the broken leg, and he is literally dangling there. His friend is uh, hunkered down, as it were, and he's holding and he's pulling the rope, trying to find out what's going on until after having been in this position for an hour, he is beginning to lose feeling in his legs and beginning to lose feelings in his hands, and it's snowing up there, and it is cold, and he makes a decision to reach into his pocket and pull out a pen knife and cut the rope. His friend, who had been dangling, falls 80 feet into a crevice that's there in the mountain. By the way, I forgot the Siula Grande is the name of the mountain that they were climbing. So his friend, already with a broken leg, falls 80 feet down into a crevice. And if you've ever been down at the bottom of something trying to get your way out or try to work your way out, you know that as you look up, you can see perhaps the light of the day or whatever it is. In this particular case, he looks up and he sees light and he tries to make his way up and it becomes evident that he cannot. And so he decides to do something. He decides, listen to me, my friends, he decides to descend into the crevice. This is what helped him to uh, pen the title of his book, which he wrote as a memoir because everyone was upset and angry at his friend for having cut the rope. But he wanted to explain the events as they had really and truly transpired. And the title of his book was Into the Void. Into the Void. Listen to me. Instead of trying to climb towards the light, he descends into what at first appears as only darkness. I want to suggest to you my brothers and sisters, friends of mine, that sometimes surrender seems like a descent into darkness. It is instinctive for you and I to climb towards the proverbial light because when you and I climb towards this proverbial light, we have control and we have the ability to see what comes next. But when we descend into the darkness, as it were, when you and I come to the point of submitting or surrendering ourselves, we have given essentially control away. We are no longer calling the shots. We are no longer in charge. What comes next is no longer up to us. The next job, the next academic pursuit, the next house, the next relationship, the next witnessing experience, none of these things are in our control because we have surrendered. And it is precisely this reason, my friends, why I'm suggesting to you that it feels oftentimes as though surrender and submission is a descent into the darkness. It is also the reason, my dear friends, why so few of us consistently practice surrendering ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Who wants to give up control? I want to share with you four steps in surrender, and then I want to share with you something extremely practical that each one of us have the opportunity to experience, and, and, and unfortunately, we, we, we miss it. We miss it. Are you ready? Okay, now, y'all know I need y'all to talk to me now. Are you, are you ready? Okay, okay, thank you, Brother Isaac. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Isaac is ready. Let's go to a familiar place to look at something that perhaps may be unfamiliar, Today we're going to look briefly at the life of Nebuchadnezzar and see how God led him on a journey of surrender. Daniel chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. As I was considering this, surrender begins in, again, an unexpected place. Surrender actually begins with grace. No, no, no. What do I mean when I say this? Theologians refer to something called prevenient grace. And what that means is the movement of God in the life of an individual before that individual is aware that God is moving in his or her life. So it's not because of anything that this person uh, has done that he or she is a recipient of the grace of God. It's not because of the way they've lived or the family that they've been raised in or whatever their belief system is. It is because God is a loving and merciful and gracious and, and good God that he moves in our lives and he does this oftentimes through blessing us. The unfortunate thing for many of us is that, like Nebuchadnezzar, we do not recognize the moving of God in our lives. How often have people, have I heard men and women suggest, well, if God is real, then he would have. And they point to some negative thing that they've experienced in their lives, overlooking all of the positives that are reminders of the presence and the activity of God in their sphere. The grace of God moving in our lives, and many of us are unaware of that grace. Nebuchadnezzar was unaware. We know he was unaware because the Bible says that he takes the vessels from the house of God and he brings them into the house of his God so as to give credit for the victory that he has achieved to his God. But I love the word of God because it says the Lord gave. It was not because of Nebuchadnezzar's military prowess or greatness or because of any strategies that he came up with that he experienced this victory. It was because the Lord gave. Nebuchadnezzar, talking about the pursuit of success and winning, uh, some historians believe he's between 21 and 25 years of age at this time. Newly crowned as the king of Babylon. And he brings this enormous amount of treasure and wealth. Just read about what, was, uh, what, what the materials were, excuse me, that were used to construct the temple at Jerusalem. And all of its articles and furnishing. And Nebuchadnezzar comes in and brings away all of this treasure. 21 or 25 years of age experiencing the grace of God and yet so consumed with his pursuit of greatness that he is unaware that it is none other than the living God who is moving in his life. My dear friends, I want to ask you, are you aware of God's movements in your life? Maybe like me, you are often so consumed and caught up with what's not going right in your life and what you need in your life that you forget to replay all of the times that God has been good to you in your life. So this first movement begins, the first movement on the march towards surrender begins with the grace of God. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these I appreciative of the narrative because Daniel, Daniel is sure, he is sure, my friends, to give praise and honor to God for revealing the secret. 
Please keep that in mind. Because what happens next will show you that Nebuchadnezzar is intentionally resisting the movement of God. So before Daniel even shares the dream, he points Nebuchadnezzar to the God who has revealed the dream. Now in verse 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel has shared the dream and its interpretation, watch this, friends of mine, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The King James Version says, then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshiped Daniel. Now Daniel just told you before he explains the dream that it's not because of any wisdom that he possesses, but it is because of God. Now listen to me, friends. Ooh, help us, Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, resisting the movement of God, finds it easier to give worship to a human being than he does to give worship and glory to God. The king answered Daniel and said, truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. Well, if what you say, if what's coming from your lips is true, then why are you honoring Daniel and not honoring Daniel's God? Let me suggest something to you, my friends. Nebuchadnezzar is no dummy. He is quite intelligent. And Nebuchadnezzar understands what it would mean, listen to me friends, he understands the obligations that would rest upon him were he to give praise and honor and glory to God. He would have to acknowledge that the victory he has won over Jerusalem was not because of his military strength, but it was in fact because of Daniel's God. This is why it is easier to worship a human being than it is to worship God. How many times in our lives has God moved and we give the credit to a human agent that God has used rather than to the, rather than to the, 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 the one who has in fact called and chosen to use this instrument? God gives grace. Nebuchadnezzar worships the individual rather than God. Then the king promoted Daniel. Again, <laughs> he could have exalted God, but he promotes Daniel. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Oh, I love this, my dear friends, because you will see a transition in the life of Daniel. We read in the life of Daniel and we, you know, we, we, we focus on what we want to focus on. But you and I will see in our short time today, we will see growth, maturity, even in Daniel. So the Bible says that he's promoted and, and all of this great stuff. Nebuchadnezzar's response to the grace of God, not only once but twice, is to worship people. Now let's look together at Daniel chapter 3. This is the story of the fiery furnace. I'm sure you all remember this. So Daniel 1, we have the capture of Jerusalem and uh, of course the, the rest of the test that Daniel and his, his three Hebrew friends experienced. Daniel 2, we have the dream. Daniel 3, we have a golden image and a fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Therefore, therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap. 
because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Nebuchadnezzar threatens Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And you know he hasn't had a, a change of heart because he's still calling these brethren by their Babylonian names that he's decided to give them. This is his third response. Follow me closely, friends. Are you all ready for this? His third response is to tell everyone else how great God is and how they should serve him. Now, did you get that or did you miss it? There is no other God like the God of these men. And now, now, listen, I'm making another decree. Anyone who speaks a word against this God, I'm going to kill them. Now, what's missing, friends? What's missing is his own personal surrender. So instead of Nebuchadnezzar, after having his word, because if you read the narrative and if, you've not, if you're not familiar with it, please, when you go home, read Daniel chapter 3, because Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah say, look, we don't even need time to think about this. We've made up our minds. We know our God is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, we will not worship the gods which you serve. And Nebuchadnezzar said, oh, your God is that bad, huh? Heat the furnace seven times hotter than it normally would be. And I want to see what God will come and deliver you from this. Now, I want you to understand the reason why Nebuchadnezzar, and if you read the account, it says that he was furious and he was enraged. Listen to me, my friends. The reason why he was so furious and the reason he was enraged is because God was invading his dream. Now, 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 now you say, well, God did that in chapter 2, right? Well, Nebuchadnezzar makes it known to the entire world in chapter 3 that I plan on living forever and my kingdom will never, ever be destroyed and I don't care what God says. Have you ever been there? Oh, don't get quiet on me now, saints. Have you ever been in a situation where God has invaded your dream, where you have a map quest and you have gotten directions on where you want to be in life and you've made all your plans, you've taken out the loan and you've, you've done everything that's necessary for you to get from where you are to where you see yourself, where you dream of yourself being only to have God knock on your door and say, not my will. Turn around. Take the nearest left, the nearest right. This calls for a detour. I don't need you to be there right now, and you don't need to be there right now. Turn ye, turn ye. And how many of us will turn, that is, turn away from the voice of God and say, I'm going to do what I want to do? Oh, don't get quiet on me, saints. Have you done that? Have you been there? I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And then after I've had all the fun that there is to have, then maybe I'll surrender to God. Then maybe I'll give myself to the Lord. And yet here is the word of the Lord. And it speaks out to every young man and to every young woman. Remember now thy creator in the days of your youth. Praise God. God says, you can come to me just as you are any time, but I would rather, listen to me, friends, I would rather have you come to me and surrender in your youth. When you don't have so much stupidity and bad choices to rub off, when you're no longer, when you don't have uh, the consequences of your wrong ideas dragging you down, I would rather you surrender yourself to me now in the days of your youth. Nebuchadnezzar's dream had been disturbed and now these individuals, these three young Hebrews are saying we stand with God and his vision for this world and his vision for you. Woo. 
Have you ever made enemies? Because you remind somebody of God's vision for their lives. Lord have mercy. Have you ever uh, been on somebody's bad side because God chooses to use you to remind someone of what he has called them to. Perhaps they've never even walked in it before, but God says through you and through me and whatever means he uses, this is the way. Walk ye in it. And they become so angry. Oh, let me, that's, that's, that's too impersonal. Let me get more personal. We become angry at the messengers. Don't talk to me anymore. I'm blocking your number. Don't want to hear anything that you have to say because it's disturbing what I want to do. It's disturbing the direction that I want to go in. So Nebuchadnezzar experiences, listen to me friends, even in that mindset, he experiences the grace of God, but his response is to turn around and begin telling everybody else what they need to do. <laughs> None of us have experienced that, of course. Miracle worship. God moves with grace. Nebuchadnezzar takes the credit and gives it to us, God. God moves again with grace in revealing that he knows the end from the beginning, but instead of Nebuchadnezzar worshiping God, he worships God's instrument. And in Daniel chapter 3, he worships the power of God and his ability without actually worshiping God himself. Daniel chapter 4 now. And at the end of the time, my Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, is warned in a dream in Daniel chapter 4 about his pride and his arrogance. And at the end of the time, he loses his mind for seven years, and he's explaining what happens at the end. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom from generation to generation. You have to understand, in Nebuchadnezzar's context, God's were neighborhood gods, as it were. They were only uh, 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 able to exercise their power in certain geographic locations, right? But Nebuchadnezzar is now recognizing the God of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as an everlasting God who knows no territorial boundaries. His kingdom is from generation to generation all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now, now, I didn't see it when the grace came. Now, I didn't see it when I chose to exalt and glorify people rather than God. Now, I didn't see it even when the flames of the fiery furnace could not harm Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and I saw the Son of God himself walking in the midst of those flames. Now, after I have been humbled, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth. In other words, I thought my dream was truth, but now I've come to realize that your dream is truth and his ways are justice and those who walk in what does that next word say friends oh there it is and those who walk in pride he is able to put down pride is ultimately what keeps us from surrender 
It's invisible, yet it's powerful. Out of all the sins that we could point out, and there are many, it is one of those, listen to me, friends, it is one of those that God says he hates. Why does God hate it? Because it, perhaps more than anything else, will be the reason why so many billions will be lost. Pride. Beloved, what may seem like being let down into an abyss or a void, this thing called surrender, is actually our only means of escape. Joe Simpson, that's the name of the individual who had fallen and who decided to descend into this void. He ultimately, going through the void, found rays of light which he was able to crawl to and ultimately find his way out of the abyss. He's alive today because he went down. In the Hebrew, the word humility, it is simply translated at its foundation to put oneself down, to humble oneself, to bow down low. I would suggest today to descend into surrender. It doesn't seem like it's the best thing for us to do, but then there is that word again in Proverbs 16. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of. We can keep climbing towards the light and die or choose to surrender and live. If any man would save his life, Jesus said, he must, he must lose it for my sake. I want to share with you in closing, because surrender is so difficult, that we serve a mighty and an awesome God. Surrender, as difficult as it is, ultimately leads us to worship God. But surrender, as difficult as it is, God has given us a means of practicing surrender. Would you like to know what it is? <laughs> I'm excited to share it with you, all right? It's called the Sabbath. I would like to present to you today the Sabbath as surrender. Now, 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 now listen. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, it says that God finished his work. Are you with me? Oh, come on. I heard one person. Are you with me? The Bible says God finished his work, right? And then he did what? And then he rested. And so here's, here's what you and I do. We try to be like God. Nothing wrong with that. We try to be like God and we try to finish our work so that we can enter into rest. But here's the problem. Is there anything this week that is unfinished today? Come on now. Is there anything in your life that you were, and then you saw the clock and you knew the Sabbath was coming and you said, okay, I've got to stop right now, even though I'm not, even though I'm not finished, even though I'm not, I'm not done, I must stop right now. The Sabbath says surrender. The Sabbath says let it go. Even though it is incomplete, even though it'll be waiting for you on the other side of the Sabbath, let it go and trust it in my, in my hands. Number one, the Sabbath helps us to practice surrender because the Sabbath encourages you and I to acknowledge that we are not God. We 
rest even with so much in our lives that is unfinished and undone. And listen, even next week won't be sufficient to get it done. If you're like me, I want to cram three years of stuff into one year. Nobody's like me, huh? I want it all done and I want it done now. But God says, stop. Give it to me. Number two, the Sabbath helps us to practice and exercise surrender because it teaches us that God is able to finish what he has led us to begin. He can both sustain it and bring it to completion, listen to this, without me. Without me. So, so, so listen to me, my friends. Whatever is unfinished in your life, this day, God says, lay it down. You know what I'm talking about. If you're like me, Sometimes you go to bed at night and you dream about what you didn't finish the previous day and you need to finish the coming day and you can't even enjoy a good night's sleep because you're thinking and dreaming about completing. Are, are you with me? Oh, no, nobody understands that. And so you never experience rest during the week because you and I are always dreaming, thinking about what we need to get done. And even when the Sabbath comes, we're like, oh man, it's that time of year. What time of year? It's that time of the year when the sun goes down so late. And I wish that it would be that other time of year when the sun goes down much earlier because then it'll give me an opportunity to get back to what I didn't finish. And yet God says, stop, stop. I can finish and I can finish without you. I can sustain and I can sustain without you. Listen to me, my friends. Even though we have the theoretical idea of Sabbath rest, how few of us actually enter in. All because we refuse to surrender. All because we refuse to say, Lord, I didn't finish. Lord, I'm fearful that I won't finish. Some of us are praying for our children, wondering if we'll ever finish. God says, I can finish without you. I can finish without you. Let me tell you, let me tell you. Ooh, I can't tell you, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. But look, 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 I've, had the, I've had the privilege and the pleasure to watch children walk into the prayers of their parents after their parents were laid to rest. Because we serve a God who knows how to complete his work. That's why we can let go. That's why we can surrender. Whatever we're praying for, whatever it is that we're worried about and concerned about, here's what God says. He says, when the Sabbath comes, just stop. Leave it in my hands. Don't you trust me? Won't you surrender? And so, so our weekly surrender, my dear friends, gives us a picture of our total surrender. How's that looking for you? How's that looking for you? Are you able to have peace? Are you able to enjoy the presence and fellowship of God and of the people of God? Are you able to just rest? Are you able to grasp the promise of God to finish what he's moved you to begin. Oh, beloved, I appeal to you 
this wonderful thing that we may have walked around for so many years. God invites us today to walk in it. But we must surrender. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Loving Father, thank you for understanding how driven we are and how really how much like you we want to be, but also understanding that all flesh is grass, that we are like a vapor. Today we are and tomorrow we are not, like blades of grass standing tall one day and the next cut down to almost nothing. Lord, the things that we want to accomplish, they are good things, many of them, and, and, and many of them we want to do for you and for your glory. But we must ultimately surrender all of these things, and not just these things, but we must surrender ourselves to you. We must learn how to lay down that which is incomplete, trusting that he who hath begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day. We must learn how to lay aside the burdens of the week, of the month, of the year, the burdens of life, we must learn to lay them down and say, Lord, I can't, I can't, but you can. Lord, I, I, I want to ask for anyone under the sound of my voice who has been robbed of the blessing of peace and rest that you have offered us because we have not surrendered still trying to save ourselves, still trying to complete everything in our lives, still trying to win, still aiming after success, not realizing that we must acknowledge that we are not you. And we must acknowledge that you can sustain and keep and complete what you've moved us to begin. Lord, help us. Help us. How can we invite others into the beauty of this rest if we are not experiencing it ourselves? Help us. Perhaps this is the reason why when we speak of the Sabbath, it sounds like a list of do's and don'ts even in the ears of our children. Help us. Help me, Lord. My appeal today is a very simple one. Is there anyone who wants to exercise, to practice Sabbath as surrender? Stand to your feet with me right now. Lord, help me to stop. Lord, free me in my sleeping hours and in my waking hours from worrying about things that only you can finish. Whether it's my salvation or that of my spouse or that of my children, whether it's a project or, or, or friends on the job that I'm praying for or, or things that simply need to get done, Lord, help us, those who are standing on our feet right now, to rest, to surrender. Say, Lord, here, you take it. If you want me to pick it back up, when you want me to pick it back up, you tell me. But especially during the Sabbath, give me freedom and peace and rest, which can only come from trusting you. And Lord, sometimes it seems like a descent into the abyss because I'm yielding control. But we've been reminded today that surrender is, in fact, the way and the key to life as it's our privilege to experience it in you. Lord, if we came into this sanctuary 
and for our friends who are watching, if they have uh, come into this sacred time and these sacred hours, bearing burdens that we ought not to carry. I pray that each one of us would leave this place and leave those cares and burdens to you. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering the humble prayers of people who sometimes resist what you want for us. And we don't even know it. Thank you for hearing us in spite of ourselves. Thank you that the Spirit intercedes for us. And thank you that each one of us can leave this place walking in surrender and in rest. In the worthy name of Jesus, let the people